cybersecurity is an increasingly important topic in the auto industry, as well as the commercial truck industry. And with the growth of autonomous and connected vehicles, it's only going to become more of a concern. On this week's show, our panel discusses how vehicles are being protected from hackers. Underwriting for the production of Autoline this week has been provided by the Michigan chapter of NDIA. And now, here is your guest host, Gary Vasilash. I want to welcome you all to AutoLine this week. We're doing something slightly different. We're at the National Defense Industry Association Cybersecurity Meeting. Um, cybersecurity is an increasingly important topic within the automotive industry as well as the defense industry. Um, as many of you may recall, it was four years ago that the famous Wired Magazine Jeep Grand Cherokee hack occurred in which the guy who wrote the story was driving outside of St. Louis and first of all had his air conditioner taken over, then his radio taken over, then the windshield washers taken over, then the transmission was cut out, and then the brakes were cut out. So a big, big problem. So we have a panel here that will address the issues germane to hacking automotive in general, as well as the commercial truck industry, which we'll learn is, is very important, and this all relates to the defense industry. So I'd like to introduce my panel. Um, we have Larry Helkeny, who is the head of product cybersecurity at Cummins. We have Bill Haas, who is the cybersecurity engineer at Lear Corporation. And we have Matthew Carpenter, who is the principal for hardware and embedded security at Grimm, and leads the Auto Exploitation Lab, which is a rather uh, interesting title. So I, I, I got to start with you. I mean, uh, so, so you have a t-shirt on that, that has a grim looking thing. Um, so let's, let's set the table here. What is hacking? Wow. You got 25 minutes? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Hacking has many definitions. Uh, the one most germane to our conversation is likely understanding a system better than everyone else and causing it to do things that it was never intended to do. Okay, but the air conditioner was meant to go on and the radio was meant to play. Mm -hmm. It was not intended to go on or play based on internet traffic. Okay. Neither was the steering or the brakes, but these are all part of a connected system. So how is, how is something like that prevented? Oh, well, we put security measures in place to make sure that the traffic coming from you know, outside sources, untrusted sources, are authenticated, uh, firewalled. Um, you know, the Jeep instance was actually, they, they found a very small hole and in an already pretty well defended system. Um, the vehicle's a complex system, there's a lot of interactions, and an attacker just needs one small kink in the defense to find uh, and you know, uh, deploy an exploit, and then they've won. So mm -hmm. in that case, um, I believe the researchers worked closely with FCA to find that kink, um, and then later on uh, you know, exploit it and, and show right. the, the, the media report. Yeah, so it could have happened to anybody. I mean, sure. it was, wasn't necessarily the, uh, the, the situation with, uh, with Jeep, per se. But um, So at Cummins, now, you guys make engines. We make engines and powertrains. Okay, so what does cybersecurity mean to you guys? I mean, is it entirely different than it might mean to Lear, which is basically making uh, um, displays and, and uh, uh, electronics for um, head units and such? So it's related. Uh, but there's also a difference. So it's related because we have software running inside a control module. And so we don't want people to do things with that software and that control module that would, again, as Matt says, make the vehicle in, operate in, in manners we did not intend. So whether that's to defeat an emissions uh, purpose or to beat a speed regulation or to deliver more horsepower that could then cause a warranty issue, those are the kinds of things we're concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so we also want to make sure that the vehicle operates as the purchaser intended mm -hmm. uh, and that it operates efficiently, safely, 
and as uh, dependably as it can. So one of the things I'm wondering about is, is that whether it is the commercial trucking industry or whether it is the auto industry, now, now the commercial trucking industry, I understand this is driven primarily by regulation that it must be connected to the internet as it were. Essentially, yes. So now with electronic driver logs, every class seven, class eight um, heavy vehicle in North America is connected to the internet and it's done to monitor driving activity uh, to make sure we have safe driving, et cetera. So one of the things that that concerns uh, us as an engine manufacturer is that's then a potential gateway into disruptive traffic and that disruptive traffic, even if it's not intentional, so if the logging is not done well, mm -hmm. it can cause more traffic on that vehicle network than we wanted, and that can cause systems to either not respond, respond too slowly, um, any number of different things like that. Mm -hmm. so, so, there, so we have a situation there where it's a regulation. On the other hand, in terms of the commercial auto industry, I mean, this is a demand from all consumers. I mean, everyone wants a 4G LTE um, hotspot in their car, right? I mean, and, and the more devices they can hook up to the car, the better. Does, exactly. does that make it more vulnerable because of this demand? I mean, because everyone wants to be able to be hooked up to the internet? Absolutely. And the reason being, in order to hack a system, you have to have some way of touching it. Now, touch roughly like radio is part of that. But the ability to influence a system whether it be over the internet or uh, from somebody coming up and plugging in a wire under the wheel well or, or something like that. These are access points for hacking. If before vehicles got on the internet, it was a lot harder to hack them. You had to uh, reverse engineer proprietary protocols over uh, near distance radio or actually touch the vehicle. The addition of an internet uh, connect, uh, connection allows for somebody to hack a car, for example, from Australia, or dare I say China. So the thing, maybe you can explain this to me, Bill, since I, you're the cybersecurity guy and I'm obviously not. <laughs> so, I'm so, best. So, so, so the question is, is, is that if, I am, if I'm in a vehicle and I'm using my iPad and I'm connect, connected to the internet, how does that have any effect on the vehicle if somebody has malicious intent? I mean, how do, how do they, or, or can't they? Well, like I kind of said before, the vehicle is a complex system. Um, you can design it in such a way that that has no effect on, on the drivability of the vehicle. And, and in fact, there are architectures out there today driving on the road where that isn't a problem. Um, there are firewalls set up. You can think of your traditional IT network at home. You have a router that's connected right to the internet. But within your you know, local network, it's firewalled off. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you can design a system where the engine or the, all the components required for the safe operation of the vehicle isn't influenced by the iPad that's streaming a movie from the internet. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. It, and then there are <laughs> systems that, that are not designed that way. Um, so you say allegedly. I mean, give us some color on that. Even the best security gateways in a vehicle have a potential for weakness. And what we've seen pushed out in most modern vehicles up to at least last year, but some this year, have a security gateway with a little asterisk by it, meaning uh, this is a marketing scheme. It really actually doesn't do real security. So what I'm really getting at is prove it. In order to prove it, and this is going to sound very self-serving because I, I run a pen testing company or, or a, a division of one. Um, but without proof, without actually hacking and beating on something, we really can't tell what the security gateways are giving us. Now, I've seen both ends of the spectrum. One, uh, one of them provides pretty significant blockages. We were able to get around it, but it took a lot of work. And others, again, it's almost like it wasn't a security gateway at all. Hmm. You, said, you said pen testing. What, what is pen testing? Obviously, it's not my writing instrument that's in my pocket. It's something else. What is it? Penetration testing can mean a bunch of different things. But, but for this regard, it is basically taking a system, looking at all the ways that we can interact with it, and figuring out methods of breaking it in interesting ways. 
So breaking the security to take over a heavy truck or uh, turn the wheels of a light duty vehicle from the internet or from some other arrangement. So when, when these hacks occur for a particular vehicle or for a particular engine, I mean, does it, does it apply to just one or to all? That's an it depends. And the reason I'll say that it depends is that, so for example, if you've grabbed an electronic tool and you've hooked up to one vehicle and you've cracked into that module and you've done things to modify that module, then it's one vehicle. If you have gotten into a back-end system in somebody's, uh, let's say, a, a, one of these electronic driver log companies, let's say somebody hacked into their servers and then were sending commands out, they could potentially then affect multiple vehicles. So it's the, it's where the attack comes from and what the attacker is trying to do will really determine the, the impact, the breadth of the impact of the attack. And if I could just add, um, the communication network that is within every car, truck, um, that also uh, can influence whether a hack affects you know, just one vehicle, one set of vehicles, or an entire industry. Um, so, so I've done research on J1939, which is a, a standardized communication protocol that um, is used in heavy trucks. And because it's standardized, the messages that are sent um, on, on, say, a Volvo versus uh, uh, another truck, Daimler, um, Freightliner, they, they are the same. So, um, you know, I've actually shown that if you send a, a message into a truck and you take that same message and send it into a bus, for instance, it will have the same effect, um, shutting off the engine, for example. Um, but if you look at the automotive industry, those are more um, proprietary communication networks. And so if you hack you know, a, a Ford Focus, even if it's uh, you know, a 2012 model versus a 2013, 14, um, you only have limited effect on, on that one vehicle architecture that you're looking at. And it won't even um, necessarily work on different makes, models, years. So that all matters when, when you look at in that segment. So what it, com what it boils down to is a combination of units and their own weaknesses. So what, what Bill was getting at is uh, a Ford or a Chrysler or a, or a GM car will have maybe a telematics unit, uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's wrapped into the sync, uh, the Ford infotainment system, or whatever, whatever that component is. That's the part that faces the internet, that's the most likely valuable component to hack. But once you get to that component, once you've compromised it and can get on, then you have to be able to send messages to the other units in the vehicle, which can vary between even models of the same make. Um, in the heavy trucking industry, it's a similar thing, even though it's a very different landscape. You have a Cummins engine, you've got uh, different Bendix or whatever components making up the, the vehicle that can be known and they're all combined to make a truck with a telematics unit. The difference is Ford makes their telematics unit, actually they farm it out, but it's a Ford thing. GM makes their telematics unit, Chrysler makes theirs, and so it's not like the heavy, ind heavy truck industry where you've got three or four to choose from, big name, very reliable telematics, but if you've compromised one telematics unit, it may be used in a myriad of trucks among different manufacturers. So is it a bigger challenge for the heavy trucking industry than it is for the auto industry, the consumer auto industry, because each of the OEMs, as you indicate, has its own topology or network, as it were, in, in the trucking industry? It's, it's basically plug and play? I think it's not. I'll let Larry stew on this for a minute because this is his industry. I don't want him to sound self-serving, but I really think that it is not in the light-duty automotive industry's best interest. I believe that what, what it's akin to is uh, obfuscation, where the fact that it's not standardized in the light-duty automotive doesn't make it more secure. What it does is it makes it a little bit of fuzzy fur on the outside of something that may be very holy and problematic. Uh, and because of the fuzzy fur, we may not find out about the vulnerabilities 
as a public until it's too late, uh, whereas that puts the impetus on the OEM to make sure that their stuff is secure. Whereas with the heavy trucking industry, things being standardized makes it easier to get to the point of attack, but then we get to, tr we get to test true defenses. And so they don't get to sit around and say, well, you know, nobody's hacked us yet. They have to say, how are we designing our systems so that everybody can get one, but nobody can get in? So, yeah, I, I will agree with Matt. Once we have addressed the issue, we have addressed the issue. Now, we'll have to keep addressing it as the attackers keep going. So I don't mean to say that there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I hope there's not, because in my case, it's an oncoming train. And by the way, it's also G1939, so <laughs> it could be hacked. Um, but I think once we have resolved that as a commercial vehicle industry, or we've put additional safeguards, as we put additional layers of defense in place, we can do them and replicate them across our products relatively seamlessly because it's the same infrastructure, same architecture, same implementation just done over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we're doing uh, to either uh, authenticate messages that, that occur on the vehicle network. We're actually working on intrusion detection within our each module within the vehicle network so that we can then say, wait a minute, why is the tele why is the telematics unit sending a full engine power up command that shouldn't be doing that it should be reading not talking so there are things we can do but once we solve it we have solved it across a broader number of pictures mm -hmm. the other thing that we have to be very careful about uh, again as matt alluded to and and bill alluded to as well it's that entry point and so we have to think about how do we manage that traffic through the entry points um, and a question you'd asked earlier was around, you know, does that ability of having my iPad being able to plug in, more connectivity means more attack surface, means more chance for something to go wrong. Uh, but our customers are demanding that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that leads me to a question, in, in, um, Bill, perhaps you have some, some insight on in this, that in the auto industry, there is tremendous effort being made to make vehicles autonomous. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the ways that this is occurring is that there is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication as well as vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. Mm -hmm. So let's say that Matt has a compromised vehicle or, or something and he's, he's sending a message to your vehicle. I mean, is, is that conceivable? And then let's say that Larry was a very nefarious guy and he got up on a telephone pole and he hacked into some um, device that, that basically told my car that the, the light is turned green when the right light is actually turning red. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, again, I mean, is, 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 the, is the increase in autonomy even make this more challenging? Well, I'll, maybe I'll answer your, your V to V and V to I, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure question, um, that it's been worked on for many years. The, the security design is very strong, and the, the, um, the underlying security has been thought about with that direct attack model in mind. Um, and so, you know, one of the things how we make sure that our roadside units, which are the, the infrastructure side, where Larry climbs up the pole and modifies it a little bit with his computer or smartphone, um, that's actually hardened against physical attacks like that. So we have a FIPS standard making sure that, you know, say you open the case and you start look, you know, poking at the chip, that will cause, say, the, all the cryptographic material to disappear. They'll, they'll zero it out um, and cause an alarm or an alert to go through the internet to the um, uh, the monitoring system that's keeping track of these systems. Um, and, and so, yeah, th there are still some open um, challenges uh, in V2V -V or V2I um, in terms of uh, misbehavior detection. So, you know, say those physical um, mitigations that we have in place don't actually work exactly the way they do because security is not 100% guarantee. There's always new attacks. Um, how do we detect then when something is misbehaving in the network? Um, and that, that's an open question, but there's a lot of good research um, in, in people looking at how to solve that, that particular question. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that Bill draw, he alluded to, uh, 
is that cybersecurity boils down to two primary things. One is design, and the design has to be good and solid and, uh, and, and perfect. I mean, it really needs to be perfect. The design of what? Of any system that has connectivity to any other thing. The design of the system has to be rock solid, secure, defensible, resilient. But the thing that we've been hacking for the last 25 years has been the implementation of a design. Now some designs really still suck. But even if we get the design side perfect, which some of our, some of our standards are coming close, the implementation will always be the biggest risk. That's where we get buffer overflows, use after freeze, other things that you may read about in a newspaper about hacking. These are the tools by which we end up exploiting computer systems most often because it's a lot easier to, def to design a secure system, even though it takes great experts to do so. It's a lot easier to design it well than it is to have all of the implementations perfect. So there are a multitude of existing systems out there right now, whether we're talking about the trucking industry or we're talking about the commercial car industry. Um, are there available preventative measures of some sort that can be applied, inoculation as it were, to protect the systems in some, some software? Um, you know, when, when the home computer gets the update from Microsoft saying that, you know, you've got new, uh, new security, is, is, is something like that available for cars and trucks? Who wants to take this one first? I'd say yes. Go ahead. Um, I look at technologies like this um, at work to, to see how we can apply them to the vehicle electronics that we produce. Um, you know, it's, it, there are a lot of details involved in, in trying to describe these things, but there are technologies out there that look at the, say, the execution flow of a computing unit. You know, these computers in your car are designed to do a function. Um, compared to uh, your computer at home, which is a very general purpose computer, you're installing software on it all the time. Um, when, you, and when you use a web browser, you're actually executing code from a, a server that you're visiting. So you know, you're not even controlling the code that you're executing um, in that case. But in a car, we have embedded controllers that have a very specific task. And because it's very specific, we can actually model it and say, um, you know, this set of execution is going to happen, um, and we need to do this for safety as well to, to guarantee that the, the function of our electronics in our cars are safe. They're going to perform the steering, the engine control, the what have you. Um, so, so because they're so um, kind of specifically designed, we can, we can look at the control flow execution and say, you know, if, if the telematics unit is sending an engine command, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be doing that. Or if there's a buffer overflow on one of the remote um, interfaces, then uh, we can detect that. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple ways that he's talking about, and a couple that, that he didn't have time to get to the, before I cut him off. Sure, um, go ahead. But there's build time systems that look through programming, programming code saying, hey, I know that this is bad, go fix it. There's post-compile or post-build time, the tools that can take a firmware image and go looking for either already known vulnerabilities that have been wrapped into the firmware or new vulnerabilities that it can determine based on doing programmatic analysis. Once we get it into the vehicle, we have network connectivity things that say, a security gateway says, you, infotainment system, cannot send a break message. I'm sorry, you can't. Or things like that, uh, of that nature. And then there's internal ECU, so program code that you can wrap into a uh, body control module or a PCM that actually does sanity checking, looking for a buffer overflow indication or something like that. Uh, there, there are actually multiple technologies already in existence for helping there. None of, their, none of them are 100%, but they all make it a lot harder. And trust me, I know. So. Here we are at the cybersecurity conference, and there's a lot of interest on behalf of the military. Is, is there dual use of this technology? Absolutely. So the military buys a lot of commercial vehicles, particularly for ground fleets. 
and those commercial vehicles use the very same networks that we've been discussing. Uh, the same thing happens actually some in marine applications as well. And so one of the things that we want to do to uh, help secure those uh, is the military will then end up benefiting from that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if you think about then how those pieces get delivered around the country, we're using heavy trucking to deliver all those pieces, parts, machinations. So everybody has an interest in that as well. Right. Um, the other thing that we talked about was V2V -V real quick, and I want to put in one last little plug, and that is when we talk about V2V, -V, right now the specifications are light duty specific, and they're not contemplating heavy vehicles. And so when we think about where an antenna for V2V -V gets placed on a car, it might be really good to make sure that the heavy truck signal can either be received or sent um, via, that's one of my favorite things is, the 80,000 pound semi may or may not realize it just hit that 4,000 mm -hmm. pound car. And we really don't want that to happen. Well, with that image, we'll have to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is a rather disturbing one since uh, we'll all be driving home from here. So, Lori Hilkeny, Matthew Carpenter, Bill Haas, I want to thank you guys all for joining us. And thank you all for watching AutoLine this week. Underwriting for the production of Autoline this week has been provided by the Michigan chapter of NDIA.